Hello. Welcome to our first ever edition of Code at Home, brought to you by Dentsu. Uh, many of you know that we've previously done a Code Media Conference. Uh, it's been in person. You can understand why we're not doing it in person this year. But we still wanted to put on a version of the show we've done every year. We bring the smartest people, most interesting people from media and tech, get them in a room and have interesting conversations. We allow you guys to participate by asking questions. And that's what we're going to do here. For the last couple of years, we've been... Uh, Really lucky to have Michael Nathanson, I think one of the sharpest analysts on Wall Street when it comes to media and tech, deliver a uh, special custom presentation for us, sort of laying out the state of the landscape. Um, and that's what we're going to kick off the event with right here. Michael, why don't you join us? Peter, good to see you. Thank you for coming. Thanks for doing this. I'm going to let you uh, kick off and, and then we'll, we'll have a chance to ask Michael questions. I think on your screen, there should be a really obvious way to ask me questions that I can then pass on to Michael. So plug those in as we go. Uh, and I'll try to forward some of those to Michael uh, when he's done talking. Good. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me. We have a quick presentation, 20 minutes, and we'll turn to Q&A when we're done. So today's presentation is really about what's happened since the COVID-19 outbreak, and then what, are, what have we learned? Four big topics. One is we see an acceleration of deflationary consumer spending on video. Typically, consumers have spent more on video each and every year, but we're seeing a bit of change that's to that typical uh, pattern. Second, um, all consumption of all video spiked during the COVID, early COVID outbreak, uh, even traditional TV, but now you're starting, and of course streaming, but now you're starting to see a return to normal on behaviors um, where streaming stays incredibly strong. Third is we're seeing an acceleration in advertising, um, which we've seen before, but this, this pandemic is really accelerating a move to digital probably more than we thought. And lastly, um, emerging from this from this time, we think the digital media companies are have even more momentum due to the shutdown of theaters, production, lack of live sports. So we see this as a real uh, accelerant, to use, a word, uh, use a word that Bob Backish uses, uh, for behavioral change. So let's go to the next slide, please. Great, so the first section is gonna be about this idea of accelerating of deflationary consumer spend. And we see two places where we think deflation will happen. One is we see a risk of stepped up cord cutting from economic pressures as people trade in more expensive bundles for, um, for SVOD and AVOD packages. And second, we see changing film windows that move certain mid-tier films more and more to SVOD distribution and provide savings for consumers where they basically trade a movie ticket off for a, um, a you know for an SVOD subscription. So those are my two big themes. I'll walk you through that first part, please. Okay, so here is one of our, I always say this every time I do a recode thing with Peter. This is our most requested chart at Moffat Nathanson. And what this chart looks at is cord cutting. And there are, are two lines here. The dark blue line is, is annual cord cutting looking at traditional distribution of cable and satellite. As you can see here, we were close to 8% year over year declines in terms of cord cutting um, by the second quarter. The good news is third quarter got a bit better. We've been surprised that direct TV satellite has done a bit better. Uh, so, you know, but still, if you go back a couple of years ago, the rate of cord cutting is, is, is pretty terrible and it is stabilizing, but it's much worse than we would have thought three or four years ago. We'll get into that another day why that's the case now the blue the lighter blue line looks at overall cord cutting and that includes these virtual mvpds like fubo which had earnings last night or philo youtube tv and um, you know those had for the most part uh go back one or two years ago they those had been used as stabilizing tools for cord cutting people were churning off of big traditional bundles and moving on to virtual bundles um, but we're starting to see that one-to-one -one transfer of like cutting the cord and getting virtual cord is slowing. And even when you add in the impact of virtual bundles, which are cheaper and, and smaller packages, we still see cord cutting down about 5% through the third quarter, which is materially worse than we thought um, before the pandemic, clearly. Um, if there's any a bright star here, it's that looks like things are stabilizing into the fourth quarter. Uh, sports has returned. Politics has never been hotter. Uh, but this is this is a key concern. We think what's happening is that consumers are cutting the cord. Those that are not satisfied by sports and news, and they're taking that consumer surplus 
and they're spending it on s and, and other DTC products. Okay, so that's that's what's happening on the quarter cutting front. The second thing that's happening is that due to the theater shutdown, studios like Paramount are now experimenting with different windows, right? So you, you have this product called PVOD, Premium Video On Demand. Um, in the earliest forms, we thought PVOD would be available after theatrical windows, meaning that when you saw a movie in the theater, certain number of days later, you would see that movie available for video on demand. But now because theaters are closed, there's no theatrical window to be had. Movies are going straight to premium video on demand. In some cases, they're going straight to streaming. So Hamilton, the example, went to Disney Plus. You know, you, you had you you have two Paramount movies, most notably, um, you know, the next SpongeBob movie going to Paramount Plus, now CBS All Access Paramount Plus in 2021. So studios now, with the absence of a theatrical window, are really experimenting and pushing more content to either PVOD or straight to SVOD. Okay, and as I referenced before something happened that we never thought would happen. Typically, we thought the theatrical window would stay 90 days, meaning when a movie was in theater, you would have to wait 90 days to see it on video on demand. That's what we thought would be a traditional window. Uh, AMC and Universal announced a 17-day window for certain titles, meaning that, meaning that in 17 days after a movie debuted in theater, it'd be available for PVOD, for premium video on demand. And this really changes, in our view, um, the windowing basis or the windowing approach to the film business. And we see it as actually quite negative for theaters. We were surprised that AMC did this. It's a benefit for the studios, but we're surprised they did it. Why is it negative to theaters? When we think about how um, if you look at the box office by share of, of box office receipts, you know, over time, consumers have spent more and more money going to see blockbusters. So 61% of all the films in 2019 had box office receipts more than $100 million within the US, right? And what we're shrinking were these mid mid um, receipt movies, movies between 50 and $100 million, movies that could have been comedies or um, you know more art films, well, not really art films, but more, more mid-budget comedies, more mid-budget you know, dramas. They were shrinking as percentage of the box because we think people just had options in terms of where they wanted to spend their time and money. Now that PVOD is created in a 17 day window, we really think what's gonna happen is uh, consumers will have more options to see these movies in home and on the margin, it won't really affect blockbusters as much as it affects those you know, 50 to $100 million box office movies and even smaller movies. Now in our own forecast, so this year of course is, is incredibly, you know, it's what it is. It's incredibly, I hate to say that. You know, box office will be down 80%. Um, but even when we go back to 2021, which won't, you know, we really won't be having a material box maybe until May or June. But we think once you get even past 2021, we see on the margin the availability of movies in home for either premium video on demand, electronic sell through, an acceleration of those windows, plus movies moving more and more from Disney, from Paramount, from Warner's to their owned and operated SVOD services will hurt the domestic box office, right? Um, so we see that as, you know, consumers trading in movie tickets and getting more value in in, in buying and subscribing to an SVOD service, especially when the movie product moves more quickly into those windows. Now, why we're so bearish about our forecast for the box is because we are the most overscreened country. This is the number of movie screens per capita in the world. And it's not a mystery that AMC um, is highly levered and Regal, which is now owned by uh, a UK company that's highly levered. There's a good chance that those companies would have to file and restructure. So our view is that you're gonna have less movie screens per capita, um, which is good for the survivor, probably Cinemark. But at the end of the day, companies that own their straight to video on demand services, like I mentioned, you know, Viacom, Disney, Warners, you could throw in Amazon and Netflix, have even more incentive to put movies that are not their biggest, best blockbusters direct to video, uh, direct to SVOD or PVOD to drive more value for themselves. So we see this as a major change, really created by the pandemic, but was moving in this direction. Thanks. Second thing is we want to walk you through what's happened on consumption. 
Uh, and what's happened now, what happened then, where things are now. So let's go to the next one, please. Okay, so immediately during the first outbreak of the pandemic in the US, you had a spike in cable viewing uh, that took a business that was typically you know, down double digits and brought things back up again. If you look at broadcast, broadcast also had some support, but as the summer wore on for broadcast and sports did not return, uh, as expect, you know, as they had the year before, you started to have facing negative negative comps and things got really tough. Now, because of the election, because the NFL is actually doing a bit better now, broadcast is actually coming back stronger uh, than where it was maybe a couple months ago. And cable kind of is bumping around the same range. So we had this immediate improvement in behavior that did not last, although broadcast is getting better because of political. I'll get to the next, next one for a sec. Now, what's really interesting about this time is if you look at third quarter ratings, live plus same day for a demo, 18 to 49, you see just the strength of news news networks. You know, this has been an incredible news year. Uh, everyone knows who's paying attention to this this presentation, understands what's happened on the news front. But news ratings are up 27% in the, in the third quarter. Um, October was equally strong. The first week of November was incredibly strong. But at the same time, the sports is down about 10%. Um, that's well publicized. It's getting a bit better now because the NFL is actually holding in quite better. And then you have other networks that are, are down, you know, double digits. Those other networks are now seeing their viewers consume more and more of that content on demand or S or, you know, in, in digital format. Right. So those networks, and I know my next guest, um, Peter's next guest will talk about Viacom and their shift, but owners of that content have to shift to, on-demand model. So this is a really good chart. We bucketed two types of content. Content that we consider, and I've always shown this to, to the record audience, live time viewed content, meaning content that you have to watch live, uh, sports, competition reality, news programming. And despite all of the changes in the ecosystem, consumer viewing of content that we consider live has been relatively flat. On the right side is content that can be time shifted. Kids, um, dramas, you know, nonfiction, um, documentaries. You've been seeing continual erosion as more of that consumption's happened on demand, on SVOD, on AVOD. And that's just, that's inevitable, right? That the bundle we think um, will probably become more and more sports and news led, and entertainment content will continue to move over to SVOD and, and AVOD models. Now, accelerating, we think this change in what's in the bundle is going to be this. We're about to go through a major renewal cycle. We already have a new baseball deal. We have a new PGA deal. We have a new SEC football deal, which was very expensive for Disney. We're waiting on, again, NFL and NHL. But on average, on average, we see a major step up coming for the cost of sports rights. Now, the networks and sports is the glue of the system. The networks that own and retain those rights will then go back to the distributor community and ask for increases because these costs have skyrocketed. The people that own key sports rights, we believe will get paid because they're essential to the bundle. They will then put pressure on networks that don't have, or, or corporate bundles that don't have live sports and force those networks that are not live sports conglomerate bundles outside the traditional pay TV bundle and into another form of distribution, if that makes sense, an AVOD or SI bundle. So who owns sports rights? Viacom CBS, NBCU, Disney, Fox, Turner, those five companies have the power to raise pricing and hold on to sports rights. On this slide, we do a survey every quarter with Harris X asking people who cut the cord, why do you stream as a replacement for pay TV? And the top two answers are always about that subscription TV is too expensive and I don't see enough value in TV to keep paying for it. So we worry the next couple of years that, again, networks that are not tied to a sports-led strategy will fall out of the bundle and will, and customers that are not there for live sports and news will cut the cord looking for, for alternatives to that, right? And, and the next set of increases in sports rights will, will definitely drive that, okay? We talk about streaming. Streaming, of course, was on fire in the second quarter. This is Nielsen charts that look at second quarter uh, really from February, early March until early June, 
What we boxed here for you is a couple things. Know that in general, we had almost 90% increases in all time spent with streaming. Uh, it slowed down, as you see on the right side over time, but it was incredibly strong for those months. And I want to also highlight for you that gray bar. So there are the big four that people care, you know, track Amazon, Hulu, YouTube, and Netflix. I don't even think YouTube should be there because it's also consumed mobily. Uh, but if you look at that gray bar, that gray bar is all other streaming minutes. And that's where you see a Pluto TV, uh, CBS All Access, which would be Paramount Plus, HBO Max, virtual platforms like YouTube, YouTube Live, YouTube TV. So there, the fastest growing part of the streaming ecosystem has been these smaller, you know, SVOD and AVOD offerings that have grown incredibly fast as more and more bundles are introduced or more and more products are introduced. You know, the big success this year, we'll show this why we call these out, is really the growth of, of Disney Plus this year. I guess Netflix's acceleration over the first half of this year. So if you look at Netflix, the company, you know, will add 5 million, added 5 million customers in two quarters when it typically takes a whole year to do that. You know, Disney Plus over literally from a year ago went from zero to 34 million customers. You know, Hulu's now at 37 and a half million. That's domestically and international. Um, you had a massive ramp again, where in two quarters of Netflix's growth equaled four quarters last year of, of subscriber growth. And for Disney Plus, which is slowly ramping, um, we're now, we think we'll be at 41 million customers. A big part of that's India. But, you know, and this will be true, I know, going forward for the next conversation too, is that there's incredible opportunity um, in the U.S. and international to, to grow these bundles. International to us is it's really a, a Netflix and everyone else. So, you know, it's not nearly as competitive around the world as it is here. And that's where I think you'll see a real investment by these companies to move it. Third is traditional advertising, uh, which we think is going to accelerate. And I'll show you why that's the case. Okay, so this is a really cool chart. This looks at e-commerce uh, spend versus traditional retail consumer spend. And what you see, and of course it happened during a shutdown, but you had you know, 44% growth in e-com spending in the second quarter and negative nine in physical. And if you think, okay, that's a little bit accelerated, it is, you go to the quarter before, it was plus one physical, plus 15. But because of that massive shift to e-commerce, you had a massive change uh, of dollars moving into digital to find these companies, um, you know, find consumers who are, who are looking for commerce on Facebook and Google and Twitter and Snap, more Snap than Twitter. But you've had a massive shift. And the point we want to make here is that in one quarter, sorry, in two quarters, we've had more share growth in terms of e-commerce share of retail sales, it's now 16%. In two quarters of 2020, we've had more share shift than four years before, right? And that's causing all companies to stop and think. And I know we'll at some point get back to normal, but we think this push to e-commerce is structural and companies now have to spend more money trying to figure out what's their e-commerce strategy, right? The other thing, thanks Michelle, is uh, we think people still don't understand what Facebook is. Facebook is not a play on television advertisers changing form. Facebook's a play on long tail. So we show this to you in the past, but let's just look at the past year. If you look at Facebook's top 100 advertisers, they barely grew the past year. If you look at the long tail of everyone else on Facebook is not one, a top 100 advertiser, they've grown by 29%. The number of Facebook advertisers have gone from 8 million to 10 million in the past year. So a small, small businesses, um, get formed and have to find companies or move models from physical to e-commerce, that long tail of small enterprises, that is the engine for Facebook. It's not TV money moving to Facebook. It's small and medium enterprise money and direct marketing money that's chasing Facebook and e-commerce is a big part of that. Okay, so here's a, here's a look at TV versus, versus digital. So second quarter was for TV was a disaster because you had cancellations of live sports, you had scatter money being pulled right away. But I guess there are two things I, I want to highlight. One is, if you look at where digital is going to exit fourth quarter of 20, 
it's going to exit at the same growth rate it exited a year ago. And that's just extraordinary in my mind, despite all the, you know, pr- the, the pressures in the, in the, in the, in the ecosystem uh, or the U S they're going to exit 2020 in probably a better shape. They were before now, thanks to political, thanks to sports returning TV now is going to exit at a faster rate as well. Right. And that's, that may be a bit mysterious, but you've had a really strong fourth quarter you had a really strong third quarter where brands came back, pol- politics were there, sports came back. So, in many ways, we had thought that TV would be weaker uh, and, and digital would be weaker as well. But when we look at where this is all going, and again, I want to make a point that this is not a share shift of TV dollars to digital, in, digital meaning Facebook and Google. This is a growth of small and medium enterprises. So the next few years, we do see digital gain to be 79, 80% of all, of all dollars. And that includes in our digital line, Things like, you know, Pluto, Tubi, uh, advanced advertising. So this, our TV line is is really a linear traditional number, but there's going to be more and more definitional blurring between what is considered an internet digital dollar versus television dollars, right? So, but we just think the next few years, there's just an acceleration. Now, something that I know is near and dear to your next guest's heart is AVOD, right? So everyone focuses on streaming wars and SVOD, it's been very catchy for everyone to write about, but we think the AVOD market, which is advertising video on demand, is is much more interesting. It's much more dynamic. You've had major M and A where Viacom bought Pluto, Fox bought Tubi. You've got Peacock rolling out. You've got Roku accelerating. This is a real business, and our view is that as time goes on, linear TV dollars will look to go into AVOD. At, you know they'll get they'll move there because they're reach extenders. They'll move there because there's younger demographics. There's probably better data targeting. They'll be sold in bundles with linear. So we really are excited about Avon and the potential of this market and what can happen over time. So lastly, you know what's interesting about this year is that the marketplace, meaning my stock marketplace, has voted. And what they see happening between the shift of e-com, the growth of small enterprises, accelerated cord cutting. If you go to the next slide for a second, what the market is saying in terms of what they're voting on is this. The market has has separated companies out uh, into into two camps. The most digitally native have been marked up tremendously. The Nasdaq is up thirty one percent, and every company on this page that's di- digitally native is up in line or greater than the, the Nasdaq, including Roku, um, is up sixty two percent. On the right side, I just want to point out that Disney is kind of in the middle, and Disney anchors this place between the growth of the green with Disney Plus and Hulu and the coming star and the legacy on the red. And they've been able to kind of escape um, the same treatment for the company on the red, who because you know the market's not giving them credit for their digital initiatives, that they're seen as, as stuck in, in a legacy model. I know that's not entirely true, but the market has voted this year and looked at, you know we want to be exposed to, to digital growth and we think that digital growth Again, we'll accelerate out of this point in time. So with that, Peter, I think I got through it pretty quickly and we turn it back to you. Um, it's always great. Um, I've got a couple questions for you. I've got okay. questions from the audience. Um, we don't have a ton of time, but if you guys have additional questions, you can p- drop them in now. We can try to pass some of those along. Michael, I wanted you to predict the future a little bit. We now know who our president's going to be next January. We've got promising news about a vaccine. It seems like People, smart people think there'll be widespread distribution by next summer. So when we come back to normalish, second half of next year, of those trends you laid out for us, which of them sort of continue at the same velocity and which ones sort of pull back and sort of look like they did a year or two ago? That's, that's a good question. Um, linear viewing will come somewhat back to normal because you're lapping such a shutdown in live sports, right? So you have the Olympics coming back. You've got a normal NBA playoff, which was incredibly weak. So I think linear viewing will, will look better. I think, believe it or not, TV advertising, because of that, will be stronger than people think sooner than we think. Um, cord cutting has surprised us, really, Peter, because we thought cord cutting would weaken into this second half of this year. It, it surprised us. So maybe cord cutting surprises us if you get a more robust sports calendar. Uh, but I do think, you know, e-com, I think digital growth exiting at the same rate as 2019 
will keep accelerating. I think the AVOD strength will accelerate. Um, so I'm expecting like 21 could be a year where like, you know, everyone's boat will rise because of the comps from 2020, you know, because things are so, so difficult from a year ago. Uh, I also want to ask you about video games yeah. um, and gaming. Um, none of the, the big media companies are really in gaming or if they are like uh, Warner, it's uh, sort of a toe. In, it's, it's a business, but it's a smaller part of their business. They were thinking about selling it. All of the big technology companies are in gaming and trying to get a bigger foothold in gaming. As someone who's viewing the world of, of entertainment, media, time spent, dollars spent, potential advertising dollars, um, how much are you thinking about sort of figuring out gaming and, and how much, I mean, it's clearly a thing. It's clearly a huge thing. Um, how much more attention should people be spending towards about gaming? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's a deficit for us. We don't cover gaming. We should. And we've, we've spent a lot of years debating it, right? Um, yeah, I, I think we do it at our own peril because I think the companies that we cover in traditional media have have not invest, you know they've they've missed it they've not wanted to acquire these companies they've you know even when 20, 10 20 years ago it was an opportunity right and i i think it's it's at their own peril right and, I, and even something like esports um generationally number of people watching twitch rivals you know professional sports on a given night right and and i think we've i think traditional analysts like myself and the traditional companies have just missed that and it's a major major risk to some of these, these these monetization models, I didn't I didn't mean to criticize you. I, uh, no, that's okay. I, I'm on I'm honest. All right. Um, let me pass along a couple questions from the audience. Uh, S spot pricing, the Hulu's and YouTube lives, yeah. is getting pretty comparable to the cable bundle price, as we sort of knew would happen. Um, the question is, can S spot come back? I think they mean can cable come back? Do you see traditional cable, the spectrums of the world, being able to sort of hold their own or claw back share? when there's really almost no difference in pricing at this point between a Spectrum deal and a Hulu deal. Yeah, that's a big part of what we got wrong in cord cutting, Peter. And not to criticize myself, you know, we saw two things happen. We saw those, and I, I talked about this last year, those virtual bundles became very expensive and cable and satellite stopped offering discounts. I think as time goes on, the, ca the, the, ca the cable companies are very happy selling broadband and not having to deal with all the headaches on pricing. So I think that's gonna that's gonna escalate. I don't see that changing. But I do wonder, is there another bundle offer coming where people come back and revisit the price points? The price points are moving up almost too too quickly, right? And so the adoption has slowed a bit versus what we thought maybe a couple of years ago. Right. And, and along the same lines is my question, right? Uh, I, I have to decide this week whether I want to renew Disney Plus. I got it for free for a year for Verizon. Um, and I've been just consuming all the all the, the new offerings, uh, many of which I'm getting a, either free or, or a discount. HBO Max will be the same thing next next spring. Um, when do you see sort of the uh, when do you see that coming to a head where consumers have to say, look, I can't have all of this stuff. I'm going to make some real hard decisions. And that, that chart you showed us where the, the gray bar is really growing with all these smaller SVODs, where that, there's a lot of pressure on those guys because people do have to make real decisions about what they're going to keep or, or pay for. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I guess, I guess spend time on this today. If you look at all the products that I have in my house, many of them are on discounted bundles. So I have Disney Plus for free. I also have a T-Mobile account, Netflix for free. Someone in my house has a Verizon. I get, I, you know, it's Disney Plus. Hulu is a college plan. I think the risk we see in this industry is once those discounts wear off, you add up your monthly bill, and it looks like your cable bill, right? Yep. So I think one of the challenges, and I love when Bob's on next, is talk about how do you manage through churn, right? Because because it it was really hard for me to churn off of Verizon FiOS. It would it would take a set like a Sunday night night yep. of phone calls. Now churning is so much easier. So I think the model re re requires so much original content. And to Disney, to your point, we did a survey on this. Disney's promotional subs, half of them are at risk of churning because they, they got it for free. They're not heavy users. And there's so many other things they want to watch. So I think you come in and out much more on this than you ever had before. Two more movie questions and we'll let you go. Yeah. Uh, have the studios been able to show that releasing their films on SVOD platforms can provide the finance can provide the, the the return to warrant the production cost? Does it make sense financially? They're, they're doing it now because they have to. 
Um, but going forward, does this seem like a sustainable model? Can you spend what you traditionally would spend on a major movie and put it out through SVOD and, and get a reasonable return? I think that it, the it's the, the question's flipped on, well, what kind of movie is it? What's, what's my budget? I think if you're making a blockbuster, you do not want to destroy these windows because mm -hmm. it's worked so well for you. I think if you're looking at a smaller movie, $20, $50 million budget movie, and those movies are not being made anymore. Those movies are, are out of favor. That perhaps it saves the economics. One big part of this is the marketing cost, right? The marketing cost to actually market a movie and then remarket home video. It's so it's so expensive to have two windows, right? So in some ways, if you can leverage that first window marketing, maybe you start, maybe you save the price of your production costs by combining windows. So I'd say the jury's still out, but we know for sure that this is not for blockbusters, but this is probably for that... $50 million and below budget movie. It's probably an, a good outcome for them. And then the last question from the audience here. You've got uh, this, this forecasting of a weaker domestic box office for the reasons we were just talking about. You, yeah. you told us we've got too many theaters. Do you see the end of the Paramount decree? We don't want to get too far in the weeds. And does this uh, give us an opportunity to sort of create new kinds of theater experiences outside of the home? Yeah. I, I don't think any of our studios will ever buy a physical theater business. I don't see that happening. I think that would be a bad use of capital. But like all of, like you think about sports environment, you're going to have to make the theater experience better. And because you had such highly leveraged companies owning so many screens, it's almost better to have a bankruptcy, wipe away that debt, bring in new management and get to retrofit and fix some of these theaters because the experience has to get better, right? You know, less screens, probably have higher per cap pricing but the experience has to be better uh that's the only way through this right and having bankrupt or heavy leverage companies as your partner is a really bad outcome for the studios so i'd be almost looking forward to seeing a restructuring of this industry to get to a better place longer term uh, i'm gonna cheat do you have a, do you have, and i'm gonna not only am i gonna ask you one more question i'm gonna get you to do my job for me what do you want what do you what's the question you have for bob backish ceo of viacom cbs the question for bob Backish w would be when you look at the amount of money that Netflix is spending to compete, and you look at what Apple's now doing, Apple's starting to get some stickiness in their shows. As you now create Paramount Plus to be a global brand, how do you decide what's the right level of content spending? How much are you going to load in advance, right? This feels to me like a, a constant always-on content cycle, right? And the companies that have succeeded have so much new original content. So I wonder how do you reckon that versus the model you have now? The model we have now in cable is a beautiful business model. You know, it's, a, it's one of the best models we'll ever see. So how do you pivot from that great model to a different model? And how do you manage your investment spending around that? Okay, Bob can hear you. He's nodding. So I'm gonna we're gonna read we're gonna queue up that okay. question in a minute. Michael Nathanson, thank you again. Okay, thanks, Peter.